Alrighty then. <clears throat> then we will call this meeting to order. Welcome Recording to the, in progress. Welcome to the February 27, 2023 meeting of the Sacramento Regional Transit Board of Directors. This is a virtual meeting. All speakers, the board and staff, please announce your name when you begin to speak. This meeting is being live streamed and the slide on the screen shows the information on how to join the webinar via Zoom. You can also call into the meeting at 253-213-8782, although if you heard that, you're already in the meeting. And the webinar access code is 837-9338-8162. If you're participating by phone, please push star nine to indicate a desire to comment. If you're joining us online through Zoom, please push the raise hand button. Be sure to unmute yourself when it is your turn to speak and voluntarily state your name for the record. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Director Budge. Here, just in time. <laughs> <laughs> Director Daniels. Here. Director Hume. Director Jennings. Here. Director Kozlowski. Here. Director Lalowi. Here. Director Maple. Director Serna. Here. Director Singh Allen. Here. Director Valenzuela. Here. And Chair Kennedy. Here. With that, we have a quorum at nine votes, and this meeting of the Sacramento Regional Transit District will be cablecast on Metro Cable 14, the Local Government Affairs Channel on Comcast Consolidated Communications, and AT&T UVerse Cable Systems. This meeting is closed caption and webcast at metro14live.sacccounty.gov. Today's meeting replays Wednesday, March 1st at 1 p.m. and Friday, March 3rd at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. This meeting can also be viewed at youtube.com forward slash Metro Cable 14. Thank you very much. Uh, would uh, everyone who can please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And that takes us to our first item, which is the consent calendar. We have 2.1 through 2.10. Is there any member of the board that would like to have something pulled or has any questions at this time on consent? Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to make a correction on the agenda for item 2.10. The resolution number should be 2023022022. The staff report has the correct resolution number on it. Okay, thank you. Director Budge, did you have a comment? At, uh, just, uh, I was going to say, um, hearing none, I will make, uh, I will move that we approve uh, 2.1 through 2.10 with that correction. I second that. Okay, we have a uh, second by Director Lolowi. Uh, is there any member of the public uh, that would like to address the board of something on consent? And you've received no correspondence, correct, Clerk? Correct. Okay, then please call the roll. Uh, Director Budge? Yes. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Hume? Director Jennings? Yes. Director Kozlowski? Yes. Director Lalowi? Aye. Director Maple? Aye. Director Serna? Aye. Director Singh Allen? Aye. Director Valenzuela? Yes. And Chair Kennedy? Aye. The consent calendar passes with 10 votes. Thank you. At this time, we will skip to uh, item number six. Is there any? member of the public that would like to address the board at this time on an item not on the agenda. Jeffrey Tardigia has his hand up. Jeffrey, go ahead. Thank you, because I couldn't see on my screen the way to unmute. Uh, I believe you can hear me. Yes, we can. 
Okay, um, simple question, um, and I would like to encourage that some workshops be done for the new board members, but this last week, it seems like we've had more than 20 bus cancellations occur with bus routes, and I've noticed particularly the one, the 51, the 30, has various times had at least five cancellations. Um, how has that impacted our performance and other stats out there? It just seems to be happening. Um, I yeah. will uh, just draw to your attention as one of the questions that comes up with both operators and drivers of knowing where, when something's happening and when something is canceled. Um, and it's a little hard even with the new app to determine what is canceled versus uh, when it says it's due and the time frame of when it's going to be arriving. I note that because of the uh, L Street corridor and what time it takes to get from one end to the other um, through there. And I do bring to the board the concern about the L and Fifth Street location is now becoming extremely busy. And due to the fact of its proximity to the right turn, and due to the fact that sometime this year or next year, that that is going to be coming a two way street with a bicycle path in there, I would recommend that our key determine through the planning staff of and city Sacramento's planning how the bicycle and other availability is going to be there because you are certainly having vehicles make turns across more than two lanes to make that right turn onto fifth street because there are multiple buses stop there for making pickups that's my public comment thank you thank you very much jeffrey and mr lee i'm sure staff is taking notes is there any other public comment? Uh, Barbara Stanton has her hand up with ridership for the masses. Welcome, Barbara. Hello, everybody. Hello. How are you? I think okay. we are all I just, fine. I just wanted to introduce myself to the new people. My name is Barbara Stanton. We have a grassroots organization called Ridership for the Masses that's comprised a group of individuals who are committed to uh, improving ridership in the Sacramento region. We've been around for about 21 years. Oh my God. Uh, and we work with, primarily with SAC RT staff, um, including Henry and Chris, hi Henry, um, on various issues. And from time to time, we reach out to the board. Uh, Welcome to the new members on the board. It's good to see new faces. Sean, I'm in your district, so uh, I'm happy to see that that a council person for District 2 is on the board. And um, we look forward to working with you all in the future again this year. And um, if you want to know about more about ridership for the masses, you can Google ridership for the masses and it will come up or we are we are at rftm.info. Thank you very much for your time and I look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> okay, any other members of the public? I was not on the agenda. I don't see any other hands up. Okay. Thank you. Then we will move on to item 7.1, which is an informational item, Sacramento Region Zero Carbon Transportation Initiatives. Is there a staff report? This item will be presented by Shelley Valentin. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can. Great, thank you. Good evening, Chair Kennedy and the board. My name is Shelley Valentin. I'm the Deputy General Manager for SACRT. And it is great to be here tonight with friends to share the work between what we call as the Four Agency Collaborative. Throughout the years, we have been sharing how the four agencies, which are SACRT, SACOG, the Sacramento Metro Air Quality Management District, and SMUD, have been partnering on shared goals. Together, the agencies have identified four major initiatives around transportation in our region. 
This alignment is important because of the historic funding that's available at the state and federal level focused on the cleaner transportation sector. Joining us tonight, please join me in welcoming our uh, partners from each of the agencies involved. Rachel Huang, Director of Customer and Grid Strategy at SMUD. Sam Shelton, Senior Analyst at SACOG. Jaime Limas, Transportation and Climate Change Division Manager for SMUD. And representing SACRD in this collaboration is Chris Flores, who unfortunately is unable to present tonight. So tonight we plan to share the group's work product and the next steps for implementation. <clears throat> next slide, please. In recognition of the importance of a focused and aligned region to advance clean mobility in support of improved air quality and reducing green, greenhouse gas emissions, staff from the four agencies has been meeting on a monthly basis to share information and to work collaboratively on initiatives to advance our transportation goals. We have recognized that our respective agencies share common goals, advancing clean transportation, resilience to climate change, and enabling healthy communities. As such, we have developed a joint strategy that brings together our organization's efforts to, de to deliver upon these outcomes by reducing BMT, transition to zero emission fuels, and investing in underserved communities. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the joint strategy is centered on four focus areas. First is zero emission transit fleet conversion and refueling infrastructure. Second is zero emission goods movement and medium and heavy duty fleet transition. The third is charging stations and clean transportation options for under-resourced communities. And the fourth is community workforce development. Late last year, the group took the strategy to the next step, developing a more detailed plan to prepare the region for the funding opportunities at the state and federal level. The collaborative produced a 28-page document and a socialization deck that can be used as a presentation on the areas the region is aligned to and are working together to attract funding. Each of the four areas includes additional information on goals, key activities, design concepts, and high-level timelines for achieving overall outcomes. So let's go ahead and give a bit of additional details on each of the four areas, starting with the first one. The transit fleet conversion and refueling infrastructure. Next slide, please. Sakarati is required by the Air Resources Board to transition to 100% zero emission bus fleet by 2040. And after 2030, any bus purchase we make must be zero emission. In total, Sakarati has approximately 500 buses in our fleet, a mixture of big buses and shorter cutaways. Currently, Sakarati has 24 zero emission electric buses in our fleet, 15 are big buses and nine are cutaways. With support from the four agencies, Sakarati has developed a zero emission bus rollout plan, providing a roadmap for the transition. And we are currently considering both electric and hydrogen for our fleet. We are now moving forward with facility planning to accommodate a future zero emission fleet. We are currently exploring potential sites for two new bus maintenance facilities, one in the north part of the county and one in the south area. An ideal bus maintenance facility will have the following, approximately 20 to 25 acres, be able to serve 150 to 200 vehicles, be feasible to add on-site fueling and charging facilities, be in proximity of existing transit service, and have ample space for maintenance and operational functions. And that's why it's so important that we have worked with our partners to consider what infrastructure upgrades will be needed. We need to work closely with the collaborative and share our vision for the region. And now I will turn you over to Sam Shelton with SACOG to cover the second focus area, goods movement. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sam Shelton, Senior Analyst with SACOG. And we're happy to be a partner in our joint zero emission vehicle planning efforts including freight planning. Uh, trucks are a small share of the total vehicles on the road, about 3%, but are responsible for 23% of our greenhouse gas emissions and about half of our nitrous oxide and particulate matter 2.5 emissions. Uh, so finding a, a way to help turn over those truck fleets to uh, EVs or hydrogen vehicles is a real opportunity. You know, several years ago, SMUD was able to interview fleet managers who shared that they were discouraged by the risks of buying zero emission vehicles, trucks, without supporting infrastructure for their fleet's long trips 
along our interstate system. Public investment likewise might wait for private industry to purchase the trucks before installing the large megawatt DC fast charging stations to ensure their use. We can avoid this chicken and the egg dilemma by helping lead infrastructure planning. And SMUD's taken a bit of that already, having completed a freight charging and refueling uh, uh, plan for Sacramento and West Sacramento. And SACOG plans to build off of those findings. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks to a half million dollar grant from Caltrans, SACOG will soon kick off a uh, freight zero emission vehicle study across the Northern California mega region. A study totaling 11 medium and heavy duty vehicle charging and refueling plazas with about five located in the greater Sacramento area. And we're already starting to see some private interest in the uh, truck charging and alternative business model uh, uh, space, uh, such as providing uh, electric vehicle trucks as a service. Uh, the mega region study objectives include, uh, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, meeting state and, and federal mandates on fleet conversion, uh, but also avoiding and reducing impacts of truck charging fleets and refueling traffic on under-resourced communities while pursuing improvements to address community health and safety disparities. We're also building partnerships with folks who don't normally talk with each other, such as Caltrans and MPOs and local jurisdictions on this kind of infrastructure planning and development as well as our air districts, utilities, and fleet operators. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, while we do have a map of initial locations throughout the mega region, we have identified in a uh, 2020 utility-led study uh, some of the energy needs, and that's just a starting point. We'll be digging deeper in our study about the initial $100 million cost estimate for DC fast chargers of the size of about 25 megawatts. Uh, we have yet to kick off the study. We've only just been awarded the grant funding from Caltrans, so we'll be kicking off in the, in the coming months, and we'll complete the study by early 2025. Some of the early priorities that we'll identify in this year could be eligible to uh, attempt to, to go after federal and state funds. There's quite a bit of money uh, starting to pop up for medium and heavy-duty freight charging and uh, refueling facilities, including hydrogen. Uh, so this study's timing is lining up really well with some of these ideas. Uh, for future e-mobility hubs, co-location of transit refueling and access, as well as inclusive planning in our under-resourced communities. I'd be happy to pass it on uh, to our uh, friends looking at charging and transportation options under resource communities on the next slide. Jaime. Thanks everybody. Jaime Lemos here with the Sacramento Air District. And uh, as Sam mentioned already, you know, he talked about the, the big rigs and, and the goods movement sector as being the fewer number of those vehicles, but being a larger source of emissions. And so we also have to take a look at the passenger vehicles, right? The cars that we that we're that we drive in, that we get into mostly every day, right? And we take our kids to school. And that re represents a larger number of vehicles in the, within the region, but also very similar to the truck emissions. Uh, we also have a large number of, of emissions being put out by these passenger vehicles. So both the big rigs, which is the goods movement sector, and the light duty passenger vehicles really make up the largest sector within our air pollution uh, within here, within our, our region. Uh, we also have to take a look at, you know, how we're moving people around, right? We talked about moving goods around in, in a zero emission factor. And, and equitably, but we also have to look at how we're moving people around, right? And as SAC RT, you know, that's the business that you're in, right? But as we look at, you know, single households, as we look at individuals, you know, we, we also know that there are many areas within Sacramento that many people can't get around in, right? And so we've been looking at some of these with all of our partners and the sustainable communities map is, is a really good tool that shows uh, some of these areas that are underserved in, in many different factors, and one of those would be transportation, right? So we're looking at uh, 52 mobility hubs within the urban areas. Uh, I'm sorry, 52 mobility hubs all over Sacramento region, 26 within the urban areas, and then 26 within the rural areas. This way it gives uh, a good model both for urban and rural areas. We're looking at 100 and 182 light-duty EV chargers, right? Sam mentioned a little bit about this whole chicken and egg concept. And so, you know, what, what do we develop first? <clears throat> Excuse me. The, the EVs or the EV charging stations. But we know 
that most people will not get into an, an EV unless there is EV charging stations. So we want to eliminate this, right? We want to do this also with hydrogen fuel. But putting 182 EV chargers within the region still is not to support the 288,000 vehicles that we're trying to get to by 2030. And of course, we have the governor's mandate, you know, with the ban of, of sales for combustion vehicles. So 182 is only a drop in the bucket. Next slide, please. We're looking at investing $182 million in these 52 mobility hubs. We, all of, all of the partners here, the four agencies have really put out, and I'm really proud of this, one of the first mobility hubs here in the nation, and that's in Del Paso. And we've learned a lot from that. We, we built a mobility hub from, ground, from the ground, basically, all the way to what it's going to be. And so we'll be sharing an invitation very soon on the ribbon cutting for that. But really, it lends itself to share that we, we, we learned a lot from that mobility hub in order to deploy these 52 mobility hubs, because not every community is built the same. Not every community has the different, has the same needs. Every community is built differently and every community has different needs, right? And so we have to really embrace the community, understand the community, talk to the community about what those needs are. This is the way we get the community to really adopt those mobility hubs. And, and a lot of this is really stemming out from, again, the sustainable communities map. We know here within the Sacramento region, the areas that are underserved, but not all of those areas may need a mobility hub. So we're really engaged with the community to make sure that, that it, if a mobility hub goes in there, we know what the profile would be to make sure that we fit those transportation needs. Next slide, please. So we're looking at level two chargers is really what we're we're focusing on. Uh, there is a sprinkle of DC fast chargers with, within some priority areas. Not everybody needs a DC fast charger. Everybody says, you know, we want DC fast chargers because we want to get in and get out. But the reality is that most people, and, and that's even us in, in our work and in our capacity, we bring in our EV char EVs to, to charge at work. And so we know that even with our car share programs, many of those are, are level twos. And we do have some DC fast chargers in there uh, to make sure that, that there is enough fuel in the tank, right? So when we need it, but mostly level twos is what we need. We, as I mentioned already, the sustainable communities map with, that SMUD has developed with along with all of our partners, we have lots of tools, uh, including all of you and all of your stakeholders. So we'll be reaching out uh, with the IRA funding and lots of funding opportunities that is, you know, that many of you know about we're looking at a lot of opportunities where we can submit proposals to be able to put many of these these hubs in. Of course, we're working with our partners like Community Resource Projects, La Familia, uh, and many others, Green Tech, uh, because they're the ones that are out there and they know what the community is. And so we don't want to do this without them. We want to do this in partnership with them since they understand the community. And so with that, I will pass it on to Rachel Hong from SMUD. Thank you. Thank you, Jaime. Um, and thank you to the RT board for having me tonight. Um, so I definitely appreciates the partnership that we have with RT as well as um, the other partners we have within the four agency collaborative. So the last topic area of our strategy is community workforce development. You know, we recognize that this transition to a zero emission transportation future, it's a huge opportunity for our region to enable inclusive economic development by training members of our community, particularly those that are within our underrepresented and under-resourced communities, and creating a pathway for them from training to employment within high-paying um, clean jobs. And this actually matches really well with the significant need of skilled staffing to support the zero emission transitions and those three focus areas that actually my partners just mentioned. And frankly, um, we actually need to have a lot more workforce and we're not going to be able to make that transition at the pace that our statewide goals are requiring unless we have additional skilled workforce. Next slide, please. So we are seeking opportunities for external funding to support workforce development. We're doing it in a number of ways. Uh, we recognize that there are specific workforce development funding opportunities, as well as those that are actually woven into the transportation space. We're taking both approaches, given the importance and how workforce development can help contribute towards supporting equity goals and investments in disadvantaged communities, as well as under-resourced communities. We're seeking $145 million, recognizing that we're gonna need to engage with our communities in different ways to build our future workforce from members of the community in an inclusive way. Next slide, please. 
So to accomplish this, our strategy includes um, multiple facets. It includes identifying the jobs needed and assessing the skills required for entry level employment. It's partnering with our educational institutions, trade organizations, community based organizations and others to continue building and expanding tra training programs relative to the skills that we've identified that we need. We're gonna be working with key partners to ensure that training includes job preparedness and placement, as well as helping guide participants in things like writing resumes, securing interviews, as well as supporting them even through the early stage of employment by ensuring access to wraparound services like childcare, transportation, case management, and more. We know that it's important to establish strong relationships with the trades and employers, labor organizations, and regional employers from the start to ensure that the training programs meet those needs, as well as to ensure that the candidates are prepared for jobs from the employers for themselves. We've actually started this work already and are collaborating with community-based organizations to train members of our under-resourced communities in multiple technology areas, including distributed generation, installing electric space and water heating equipment, as well as electric transportation infrastructure. And we've started a workforce development program in partnership with the California Mobility Center specifically focused on those clean jobs. And with those efforts, we're working on towards 4,000 um, people trained and at least 1,000 people hired into high paying clean energy jobs by 2024. I see board member Venezuela has her hand up. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. I can wait till oh, the end. Okay. Um, and with that, actually, I will hand it over back to Shelly. Thank you, Rachel and everyone. So I want to just conclude by summarizing and highlighting the importance of this document. We have thought carefully about our mobility priorities and how we move people in our communities, while at the same time addressing climate change and uplifting underserved communities. Sakarty is very appreciative of the partnership and the collaboration across the four agencies. You are so proud to be presenting this uh, as a group uh, to you all tonight. A copy of this presentation and also the full document is available in our staff report. So we are all in alignment moving towards a zero emission transportation sector and we are happy to hear additional feedback from our board and for you to provide additional guidance on how you would like to see us moving forward. And that concludes our presentation and we're happy to answer any questions. I'm muted, Director Valenzuela. <clears throat> thank you, Chair Kennedy, and thank you all for that presentation and that update. I had read the document, I think, when it came out. I think you said last year, and putting this in context is really helpful. I wanted to hone in a little bit on the last um, slides on workforce development. Um, I don't really want us to spend too much time trying to create pathways that already exist. And something that I'm really concerned about in climate work, both here in Sacramento and statewide, is our partnership with the trade unions and, and really making sure that we're not reinventing the wheel, that these jobs we create are high road jobs, not just high paying jobs, but you know, jobs with benefits. And um, you know, a lot of this work that what the apprenticeships do, but then what the pre-apprenticeships do and what organizations do to really support folks as they're entering in. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how we're aligning with that. I know several of them have asked me specifically about EV charging and how they could try to get at the table for this inciting plan. Um, but there is a tension here because I feel like sometimes what we do in climate is we try to go fast um, and instead of going deep. And that sometimes means that we sometimes will trade off going with a lower bid competitor to go out and say do home improvements rather than go with somebody who might be providing those types of high quality job opportunities. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, maybe Rachel, I see you came back on screen, how that's working in this plan. Sure. Um, you know, and I think when when we developed this plan, it was really sort of that strategic approach. There's sort of the tactical work that we're doing. And, and I think you're right in that we're not trying to create okay, new training programs for new positions. We're trying to actually utilize what are existing positions that um, might exist and making sure that people have access to be able to do the actual application, but within certain um, job classifications. And that's whether it's EV, whether it's EV installations for charging or building electrification and things like that, we're definitely um, approaching that of like, how do we more sort of be able to um, enable them to do the, the the, the end use piece versus necessarily trying to create new classifications. So we're not necessarily trying to create any kind of new classifications or new job descriptions. 
No, I appreciate that. I guess maybe this is a question then for the folks who talked about some of the grants that we've applied for. Are we planning on partnering with with contractors and with organizations that employ these these trade unions? Because that's part of the chicken and egg here is that until they get enough demand for these jobs, it's hard for them to tell train a bunch of people to say, hey, we're all only going to do EV charging because, you know, if the jobs aren't there, then what are they training them for? So I guess I just want to make sure it's the grants that RT are the grants that RT is participating in really creating those opportunities for for high quality jobs. So maybe that's a question for the folks who talked about the grants we're applying for to implement the trans the EV charging hubs. Director Lawrence, well, I'll I'll take a a little bit of a crack at this one. Um, I think in this space with EV charging, there's a little bit of a difficulty um, specifically in this, and this is maybe where we can even ask some of some of the elected officials for help here because there are, are certain specific trade unions that have created um, very specific EV charging certifications that only select uh, electricians and elect electrical corporations or companies within the Sacramento region even have the certification. It's called the EVITP certification program. And it has made it extremely difficult for us to even hire any any electrician here locally within the Sacramento area. Um, we've talked uh, with the electrical trade unions even about this because um, the the certification process is very challenging and many and it leaves many of our, our elect electrical folks and companies out here within the region. And so so that's something that we are definitely looking into because we definitely want to support the unions. And we definitely want to su support both local mom and pop electrical companies, right? Um, and spread kind of the the, the grant funding out. Um, even within our grant process and the dollars given out from the California Air Resources Board, the EVITP is, is something that is a mandatory. But then there's also the a condition within some of the grants to hire local uh electrical companies so that we can ensure these high paying jobs right so even amongst arb it's creating a little bit of a challenge and so this is something that has been brought up to arb as well um and and as of right now there 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 doesn't seem to be a clear path on on how to get more companies uh certified and so um, we're still at it and even us as the air district it's important for us because we want to move on a lot of these projects and it's really challenging Okay. Well, my last comment then I guess will be that this sounds like something that's missing from the strategy in terms of making sure that maybe we're applying or working with the chambers to try to get that certification to more of our small local businesses because obviously we want both high quality jobs and we want those that benefit and that economic reward to come to people who are working here locally as much as we can. So I would just highlight that as maybe an opportunity for not just continued conversation, but actual part of the strategy is if we're seeing a gap in local providers who can meet those requirements, then we want to make sure that that's happening. And we're not just kind of going out and lowering the standard for these jobs because we want the highest quality project, the highest quality jobs and for local people to benefit kind of all at the, at the same time. So um, that's it for me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Director Budge. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and I appreciate uh, Katie's comment simply because, um, especially over the last couple of years, there has been so much uh, money for training coming out of the feds and the and the state government. Um, you know, from the um, uh, American Recovery Act program and whatnot. And so, both the city of Rancho Cordova and, and the, the Rancho Cordova Chamber of Commerce are involved in several different training programs. They're not specifically um, EV oriented, but there's a lot of money on the uh, running around right now for um, for employee training or up training. Um, but I have two specific questions and they might be for Jaime. Um, Jaime, define a level two charger. Uh in, in general terms, a level two charger is something that would refuel your electric vehicle um, in about four hours or so. Um, a DC fast charger would refill or you know fully fill your vehicle within a matter of 30 to 45 minutes. And then a level three charger is something that we typically would have at home where we plug in overnight. Okay, I get it. Um... The fast charger is uh, 
the fast charger is at Pisu Patterson's um, down at uh, uh, where the road takes off to Monterey. Um, and we have the NEMA uh, something or other at home. Um, so I, I, I get the distinction. Thank you. Um, and then the real question is, you keep talking about hydrogen, but there hasn't really been any public conversation about hydrogen since Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor. So what's going on behind the scenes that none of us are aware of and might be bringing hydrogen out of a warehouse in West Sacramento into the basic public discourse? Yeah, there, there is actually a lot of conversations in the region about hydrogen. Um, we have been at it here at the agency for over a year now, but to give you an idea about our hydrogen capacity here in Sacramento is we produce, and then you know we meaning a, a company here in Sacramento produces liquid hydrogen um, that gets two trailers to the Bay Area. And then that hydrogen is compressed into fuel for or fueling hydrogen or, or, or hydrogen fuel, and it gets tube trailered back to Sacramento and it gets put into our, our shell stations and, and our some of our, our hydrogen stations that we have for light duty vehicles. Um, we are in the process of, of getting more of those, those facilities here, uh, the fueling facilities, but we're also in the process of bringing hydrogen producers here in the region. Uh, one of our goals here for the Air District and, and our director, Alberto Ayala, has said, you know, we need to have our own hydrogen production here. So we are in the process of, of doing this. We've been talking with SACRT, we've been talking with SMUD and, and SACOG about the importance of that. And so um, a few years ago, we would have to basically pay people to, ba to come down to talk to us about producing hydrogen. And now we have people saying, all we need is land and we can produce the hydrogen for you. And so we are talking with folks at Sacramento County, we have some project, some proposals in um, with Sacramento County and with, and, and with us, the Air District, uh, to get some hydrogen production in place. And, and now really it's a matter of siting. Uh, where do we feel is, is, the, is a good siting for it? We're looking at areas like um, the bus maintenance facility number two that Sacramento like owns. We're looking at Kiefer Landfill. We're looking at West Sacramento. We're looking at um, regional sanitation as well, and even um, the industry complex by by the airport as well, capital commerce. So those are some areas that that we've been looking at for the production of hydrogen. But but most um, uh, at, at least here within the region, I think we are ready to to deploy some hydrogen production and facilities. Again, going back to the chicken and egg concept, um, I want to make sure that our fleets can say. We have a place where we can feel, um, as opposed to saying we can't buy vehicles because we have no place to feel. So, so we are making a financial commitment to deploy hydrogen production and fueling here within the Sacramento region. So I appreciate that. You said it might be available in shell stations. Yeah, currently we do have it available in some shell stations. Um, I know that that there's even permitted uh, permitting a permitting process that's going through right now for Florin and. Franklin, um, there's some, there's one in Fair Oaks and, and in different areas within Sacramento County. I think we have a total of five or six, and then the one in West Sac as well. And somebody's actually selling vehicles that can be fueled by hydrogen? Yes, there are. I believe we have a little over 6,000 vehicles that are hydrogen based here within Sacramento. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I would, um, um, I will suggest to our board member, uh, Donald Terry, that um, um, he put you all in touch with either uh, GSAC or with our economic development director. You know, there's there's not everybody has industrial space available, but we do. So We'd interesting to know. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Director Kozlowski. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me okay? I'm trying yeah. out a new headset. Okay. Um, I just I, I was uh, pleased to hear um, Director Valenzuela's comments because often these programs skitter off the track when we start putting requirements on things that may be unnecessary or not detailed enough. Um, either way, and I guess I just want to ask the question of, of Jaime whether 
because I heard you say that there are a whole myriad of issues with the certification that exists currently. Is is the principal thing that the certification exists or that it's too difficult or that there aren't enough people who are certified or there aren't enough people to be certified regionally? Because it could be any one of those things being the real sticking point. And I'm just wondering if, and, and uh, my point is, and I'll just take an answer and be done. Um, the the work to install an EV charger is principally just electrical infrastructure. So why there's a necessity for a special certification um, in our requirements, that's the part that I think might be the way to unlock this a little bit and then get the incorporation of more local and small businesses that hopefully are signatory to the IBEW or other union, but um, uh, open up the um, ability of others to participate that might be locked out otherwise. No, we Thank definitely you. we definitely agree, and and I think it's a, a couple of those issues. Um, I think one is state funding or state grants require the CBITP certification to ensure that you know that there's a, a minimum standard or minimum level of standard that is that these chargers are being installed. We're not against that. We we definitely agree. Um, there is one certification outfit, and that certification outfit does minimal um, certification, I guess, cohort, and that has been the challenge, I think. Um, most electrical contractors can take the, the online web class, but it's the actual certification, I think, exam or certification process that is the hangup. And so, We've been trying to even get the that requirement removed, but um, but we're not sure exactly how it even got on, or or you know it's it's something that is going to be really challenging, and probably a legislative move to remove that that requirement. Is it is it bad, or should Metro Air District become a test giver? I mean, should you become a testing agency? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Could you repeat that again? Could, you, could the SAC Metro Air District become a testing agency and remove that blockage? Um, we may not be the right people, but we definitely are in support of having here in Sacramento be, have someone be be someone to to be a certifier. Absolutely. Uh, Chair Kennedy, this is Shelley. I want to add also just an additional point as far as SAC RT is preparing for this. We because we are not the only ones in this boat, right? All of the other transit agencies in California need to prepare for this. And we are already preparing our own workforce for this new training and need. In fact, we are working with the California Transit Training Consortium uh, out of Southern California. And our staff is going to be attending some trainings already next month to be able to prepare and learn more and anticipate what are the additional challenges and technical needs as a result of this new ZUV requirement. Anything else, Director Kozlowski? Uh, just my final two cents, but it sounds like a certification that's not necessary if you're a licensed electrician. Okay. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Director Budge, I think, has uh, something to address there. I'm not sure it's required, but having been dealing, having dealt with, I'm sorry, guys, four houses since we bought the car in 2016. Um, there are very specific local electricians who specialize in installing this NEMA, whatever it is, uh, charger that you need in your house. So, for what it's worth, I okay. can give you a recommendation. All right, uh, Director Lolowi. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, I want to thank um, the staff for the wonderful presentation. My question uh, is to um, uh, Rachel from SMUD. Um, as far as the, the grid at, at SMUD goes, where are we with the investment on that, the capacity of the grid? As you recall, um, when uh, we hit uh, the 100 degree weathers in Sacramento, the governor asked us not to plug in our cars and just uh, sit tight. And then um, uh, this past uh, weekend, um, I just read an article that quite a bit of Tesla's decided to go to Mammoth and plug in and their grid completely 
uh, shut down for hours. Um, so is, is SMUD also kind of getting ready and uh, improving that grid for these um, wonderful projects that are coming on board? Thank you. Yes, that's a, a great question. And I know probably a very popular question sort of following the 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 September, you know, uh, heat wave that we had and and even even after the storms that we had in January with with regards to how do we think about grid resilience. The, the answer is, you know, SMUD's actually been looking at it for, for many years and we continue to refine our analysis. So, you know, actually years ago, even before there was really a lot of mass EV adoption, we were forecasting what we thought EV adoption might be, where the geographical clustering of adoption would be and how we need to think about our grid. Um, SMUD actually and my team specifically actually worked with our distribution planning team um, over the last year and are actually just finishing up the analysis, um, updating the analysis on, you know, how are we looking at transformer loading from a residential standpoint. Um, Sam actually talked about the work that they're doing from a regional basis um, under the Caltrans grant on um, infrastructure to support medium and heavy duty. SMUD actually, Sam talked about the work that SMUD did for the greater Sacramento region plus West Sacramento that looked at both electric and hydrogen for medium and heavy duty, thinking about not only the EV charging that's needed, but if we did localize the electrolysis to support um, creating hydrogen to fuel um, medium and heavy duty vehicles. So we've actually been doing a lot of analysis and planning to say, you know, where will we have, you know, where will given where adoption will go where we need to either make different investments um, from a grid standpoint. So we've actually been pretty proactive about that. The other thing we did last year is we launched a managed EV charging pilot. So first starting out with Ford and BMW, I think maybe Honda will be launching it with Tesla this year as well. And kind of based upon the analysis that we're doing is at a residential or light duty standpoint, if customers can do managed charging, which is like looking at different signals and trying to stay off peaks. SMUD actually has that discount of a penny and a half for residential customers for your whole house if you charge between midnight and six. And the very, very large majority of our residential um, homeowners who have vehicles or residential customers who have vehicles are following that price signal. So they're not adding to load during peak but are in charging in off peak timeframes between midnight and six. And there's obviously a financial incentive to do so as well. With this managed charging pilot that we just started last summer and expect to expand and really, you know, um, scale, we can see that actually by managing EV charging, a lot of the grid implications um, can be mitigated and you actually don't need to do grid upgrades if you can manage charging. Now, there will be a population of transformers that pop and things like that. And so we're actually doing, like I said, doing analysis, which is, okay, with the transformers that we have, which ones you know, have are, are close to being overloaded and therefore how do we need to be targeted with regards to um, replacements, especially as we're doing other things like changing out poles and things like that. So the long answer, but the short answer is, is we've been doing actually quite a bit of analysis over the years, have updated our analysis in the last year to really be pinpointed in how we address making sure that our grid is ready because, you know, the state has aggressive goals, SMUD has very aggressive goals with regards to transportation electrification and very much recognize that the grid has to be ready. It goes back to Jaime's point too, is like, you know, if you build it, they'll come. There's, I think um, we just updated our EV strategy last year and presented it to our board last spring. And really the shift in focus was, you know, we're gonna continue to encourage people to adopt electric vehicles, but as a utility, our strategy needs to be focused on how do we ensure that there's charging infrastructure available and how do we make sure that the grid is is designed in a way to handle it but in a way that's optimized so that we're not pouring money into upgrading the grid but really doing it in a smart way thank you thank you any other board members before we go to the public um, seeing none uh nick bryant you at one point had your hand up was that for this item Okay. Hang on. He, hang on. He was muted. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Let's well, guard. He's going to do that. But what is that going to look like for our buses? Fix for our buses. Is that going to affect our buses? Is that going to affect everything? Or what's what's that going to look like for us? 
I'm sorry, so you, you, you got cut off through the beginning of that. Can you restate the question? Um, about the hydrogen of our buses, I mean, what is that going to look like? Like the charging, like is that, uh, is, are these going to be electric buses where you have to charge up your buses now? Yes, that's, that's the idea, yes. So we're going to get, so that means, so that means Sacramento Regional Transit is going to have electric vehicle, electric buses now? We, we already do. We've got a number of them in place, uh, both the smaller buses as well as full size. Um, matter of fact, if you have seen the, the airport uh, shuttle uh, or bus, uh, that, that is typically electric. Uh, that's so so, that's we're, just, we're, so that, we're already, that's, we're already yeah. making the transition. Yes. That, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of money for, for us to be seeing that, that Newsom is trying to get electric buses, electric vehicles. That, that's a lot of money for you guys. And I, I, I'm sorry that you guys have to deal with that, go through this, but you know, it, it's just, it's a lot of money. Electric vehicles, it's costing a lot of money. Okay, is that and, your comment? All right, thank you very much. Uh, Barbara, you had your hand up, but I don't think it's up now. Barbara Stanton? Yeah, I actually don't see her on anymore. And now okay. Jeffrey Tardigia's hand is up. Okay, Jeffrey, go ahead. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Um, I heard before that we had to do a separate circuit for the uh, causeway or and or the airport buses. Exactly right now, what is SMUD's facility load for transit buses? Is it 14? Is it 25? Is a SMUD circuit for more than 100 buses being charged available? And will there be three areas where that's likely available to? Are we right now with the current load at 50% electrical load to that? Or is it merely 10% that we have that are, we know that are being used for electrical uh, charging? That's, I guess, a SMUD question to be directed. Okay, so uh, is there someone from staff that can uh, respond in a short answer? I believe we can uh, talk to him, talk okay. to him later. Uh, Thank you very much. All right, so, so uh, staff will get back to you, uh, Jeffrey, to give you a complete answer. Any any other member of the public? I don't see any hands up, but I did want to make a note for the record that Director Hume did join us at 540. At the okay. beginning of 7.1. <laughs> Great. All right. This, uh, as I said, this is an informational item. Thank you very much to uh, staff from all of the agencies. As somebody who actually ran SMUD's electric vehicle charging installation program in the 90s, um, you know, I, I will tell you that I have complete confidence that SMUD will be prepared. Um, I've met with their planning staff and uh, they, they have been forward thinking. Uh, we even did a study back in the early 90s about how many houses in the Sacramento area would have to have retrofit panel uh, in order to, to meet the need. And, and it was a relatively small number. Um, so, uh, and, and as I said, uh, from a bigger perspective of the grid, um, I, I am extremely impressed with how the thought that they've put into this already uh, and have been for many years um, and, and confident that uh, we'll be able to handle this. As far as costs go, you know, uh, climate's going to be very expensive. Okay, if that's all, then um, we will move on to item number eight, the general manager's report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Rachel, Sam, and Hami for uh, joining uh, Sherry to present this highly collaborative and, uh, you know, we worked collaborative initiative and we'll work together, four agencies work together uh, over last year to uh, we met about like over a dozen of, you know, times and did a lot of analysis. And finally we have this presentation to four different boards. And uh, we will take uh, our board members feedback very seriously. And uh, we will work more broader, uh, um, partners like uh, trade unions and others to implement this aggressive plan. With that, 
uh, I will go to my you know, report. Um, again, you know, um, good evening, Chair Kennedy, members of the board and the public. Thank you for joining us today. To begin, I want to wish everyone a happy Black History Month. In recognition of uh, Black History Month, uh, Sakati has been exploring, celebrating, and highlighting the rich history, lives, and stories of Ameri African Americans. On February 4th, Sakati celebrated the life and the legacy of Rosa Parks to raise awareness of the significant role that transit has played in the American civil rights movement. Uh, as part of our recognition, Sakati reserved a seat on each of our bus and provided free rides on all Sakati fixed route buses in honor of Rosa Parks' birthday. And move on to next slide. Last week, we had the pleasure of sharing Sakati vision, accomplishments, projects, and priorities when we hosted officials from the Federal Transit Administration's Region 9 office in San Francisco. We were joined by Congresswoman Matsui, Board Chair Kennedy, and FTA Deputy Administrator Amy Chen Chin. And we truly were uh, very grateful of both Congresswoman and the Chair Kennedy spending the whole four hours or more than four hours uh, the time uh, with our presentations, discussions, and the bus tours uh, with FTA and Sakati teams uh, and the representatives from Senator Pendina's office and uh, SACAC. The visit included uh, presentations from both FTA and Sakati and a site tour of the downtown Riverside streetcar line. Uh, Sacramento Valley Loop project, light rail station conversions, and their planned bus rapid transit line on Stockton Boulevard. The meeting was highly inspirational, and we look forward to hosting more federal team members, such as Secretary Polichat, FJ mm -hmm. Administrator, and other officials from DC and the Region 9 in the future. The next slide. Uh, I want to congratulate Sakati's communication and marketing team for winning the first place award in the 2023 APTA Atwell Award competition. The Sakati team has won the award from the best marketing and communications to highlight transit needs. We have been recognized for our citizens Transit in Academy, a free five class course designed to educate and engage residents, business, and community leaders about our planning process and how public transit shapes our communities. Since launched in early 2019, over 100 people have graduated from the, this class. The next slide. Uh, early this month, Moody's Investors Service published a research report on the financial status of California's transit agencies. The report found that Sakati has an A2 financial rating and uh, one of the most favorable outlooks of any agencies. Let me read a quote about Sakati from this report. It says, the agency will add to already sound operating liquidity by the end of fiscal year, fiscal year 2023, providing additional cushion to weather operating headwinds from potential sales tax volatility as the economy cools, rising expenditures, especially from labor costs and at the end of federal pandemic aid, which Sakati officials plan to spend down by the end of fiscal year 2025, which is June 2026. 
This report also noted Sakati has first improved liquidity position from prudent financial management, federal aid infusions, and strong sales tax performance. Second, ample debt service coverage on bond ordinary spaces, giving pledge of local transportation fund distribu distributions generated from local sales tax. And an economy anchored by, anchored by the state of California's uh, capital, severe higher, uh, several higher education and uh, healthcare institutions. Additionally, early this month, uh, the Secretary Retirement Board held a special retirement board meeting focused on the status of Sakati's pension plans. Over the last 10 years, our three pensions funded ratios increased by more than 10%. We anticipate that over the next five years, all three pensions funded ratios will be over 85%. And in 10 years, by 2030, 10 years from now, all three ratios will be 100%. This is an extremely important message and very exciting news too, because by 2030, our pension cost will be reduced by several, by over like 30 to $20 million. Now we can use that money to saving, put that back to the service. I mean, this is really due to great patient management policies and intelligent practices by staff, consultants, and our board of directors. The next slide. Speaker of strong financial practices and being a good steward of taxpayer dollars, uh, Chris and I had the honor last week of spending uh, nearly a half, an hour and a half with the Sacramento grand jury, highlighting Sakati's vision, amazing accomplishments, as well as exciting projects and uh, programs. Uh, grand jury is the only independent watchdog investigative body in the county. It has diligently monitored the performance of local governments and ensured that the institutions of the government are responsive and fair to those who are governed and the taxpayers' dollars are used wisely. It was truly a great pleasure uh, updating them on Sakati's initiatives and then they were thoroughly uh, impressed how the agency has been able to transform itself over the last uh, multiple years to become a leader and a model of success for the industry. And Chris and my only regret is that they had only given us some positive feedback for the agency and uh, did not assign us some homework. So several uh, jury, jurors actually you know, highly appraised our uh, student, students right free program. The next, uh, it's about live real station modi modification. And uh, I just want to thank SACA, the team, uh, progressing our live real station modification project effectively this month. Over two weekends in February, our team was able to successfully complete the construction of the platform modification at the 48th and the 59th street stations. One and a half days for one station we complete, one station within one and a half days. And which normally we say, uh, we, we will say a public agency will spend probably a week to complete. The next two station modifications will take place at the 39th street and the 29th street stations. The 39th Street station will be closed uh, for construction uh, on March 4th and the 5th, and the 29th Street station will be closed for construction the weekend, 
March 11th and March 12th. A bus bridge will be in place during the closures and the normal light rail service will resume on the following Mondays. And then this is a significant milestone as we accelerate uh, our light rail modernization efforts and prepare to launch the new low flow vehicles into our gold line service, entire gold line service, uh, hopefully by spring or in the middle of next year. Then uh, continuing the topic of uh, system improvements, as we just talked about, you know, uh, the, the GEV strategies, uh, at the beginning of February, the first of two new CNG compressors was delivered and will be fully installed by this summer at our bus maintenance facility one in 29th Street. This replaces the outdated compressor and will significantly speed up filling of buses needing to improve operational efficiency. As many as, as many of you might have noticed on your gas bills recently, CNG prices are the most expensive in recent years with the State Department of General Services notifying all its customers of a possible 10 full, 10 times increase in prices for January 2023. Natural gas cost for F for FY 2023 has been higher than expected with the December 2022 bill increase, increasing month over month by 100%. Sakadi's normal price for natural gas is uh, approximately 70 cents per therm, with December's bill increasing to $1.40 uh, cents per therm. January's expected price is $4.95 or $5 per therm, which is approximately 600 times higher than our normal price. Price are expected to expected to return to normal levels in the coming month, but the total FY 2023 impact, budget impact is estimated at 3.5 million dollars. Our annual budget for CNG is about 2.5 million. Now it's about $6 million. And we will continue to monitor the situation closely, but this is a, uh, it's a big impact on our budget. Uh, next slide. As we begin the new year, it is also the beginning of a new two-year state legislative session. There are a number of new faces in the state legislature, including from Sacramento region. We have been meeting with the new state delegation to update and educate them on Sacramento's priorities. Sacramento will be sponsoring, we're sponsoring two separate pieces of legislation this cycle. Uh, I want to thank Assembly Member Stephanie Wen, previously. Uh, Elk Road Council member for introducing legislation to improve Sakati's public contract code and adding one more board seat from Elk Road, which staff is scheduling a meeting for board ad hoc committee to discuss this further, I think in March 15. Then assembly member Kevin McCarthy has introduced a legislation that would update our authority to place a tax measure on the ballot. Specifically, it would allow a jurisdiction within Sacramento's boundaries, such as the city of Sacramento, to tax itself to benefit Sacramento. We are hopeful to move these two bills through the legislative process while continuing to receive board new guidance. To conclude my remarks, I want to remind everyone that the Sacramento Regional Transit District is attending 50 years old this year 
on April 1st, 5050 years. We have a number of events planned to celebrate the significant role we have played in shaping our community over the past half century. There will be various fun activities for employees and customers being planned. Please keep an eye out for more information over the next several months. This, uh, Mr. Chair, this concludes my GM report and I would be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Are there any questions of the board? You don't look a day above 49, Henry. Good job. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Director Singh Allen. Thank you. Thank you, Henry, for that great presentation. And SAC RT's come a long way. And I would really attribute a lot of the great advancements um, to your leadership. So thank you for the update and all the great work that you're doing and the team, of course. Team. Thank you. And the board too. Absolutely. It, it, takes, <laughs> it takes a village. <laughs> but you're the leader of this organization and you're doing great things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Any other any other board members? Do we have anyone from the public like to speak at this time? Nick Bryant has his hand up. Mr. Bryant. Nick. I want to thank Henry Lee for everything. And I want to thank his what he's been doing. Nick, 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 we can't hear you. Or at least I can't. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, I want to thank Henry Lee on everything and appreciate what he's done through our community, the SAGRT, and other things. To, but there were some other things I wanted to address is that I've seen a lot of connect car, connect car machines not working on their buses, not working on our at light, rev at light rev stations. Most of them has been cracked and I, most of our screens need to be replaced because homeless people are cracking our machines, they're damaging them. So I feel like it needs to be fixed and we need to switch our connect car machines on light rear vehicles from now on because we can't trust homeless people anymore. We can't trust anybody. That's gonna mess up our, our machines anymore. So it's like, we need to transfer them on our light rear vehicles. I would, I would ask Henry if we can get to work on it. Henry, what, what do you think that we can do with them, with the machines? We will take on this as soon as possible. Thank you for uh, reminding us on that. Yes. Is that all, Nick? Sure. Yeah. Why okay. are you in the chart? Why? I don't know. That's okay. it. Um, I do want to say thank you for everything with our team. What have they have done? Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Nick. Any other member of the public? Jeffrey okay. Tardigia has his hand up. Jeffrey, you're up. Um, Henry, are you going to mention about the uh, effort with, that you're doing with KVIE on March the 23rd? Um, I just bring that to your attention, and uh, I hope the other board members know about that. Um, that's my comment right now, and I will ask you more tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Any others? I don't see any other hands up. All right, thank you very much. With that, that takes us to item number nine, 9.1, the San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority meeting summary. Do you have anything to add, Director Hume? Apologies, I do not, Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. And 9.2, Capital Corridor Joint Powers Authority meeting summary as of, of February 15th. Uh, Directors Daniels or Maple, do you have anything to add? I have nothing to add. Thank you. All right. With that, then, if there's no other board members that uh, would like to address the board at this time, uh, I believe we are adjourned. Thank good you, everybody. Morning. All right. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs>